Okay. So maybe the first thing I would like to ask is if, if there's any question on, on the topics we have discussed it together, also general questions over this. Are the bases, I'm starting from the biological bases, clear enough or sh sh should I spend some more time in discussing those? Okay, looks all clear. What I would like to, to do now is to start delving uh, in, in some more details in the framework which I've highlighted in the, in the first part of my lecture. And so uh, the following, I think I will only give two, like, two more lectures. So uh, overall, what I will discuss is, on one hand, what, what's the data? And what the data is telling us about our chromosomes are folded. And this is what I call part one in the, in the slide. And then uh, in part two of my lectures, um, I guess tomorrow and, and the day after, I'll try to, to enter instead on, on the use of polymer physics and machine learning to, to make sense of the data and what could be the physical principles behind the organization that, that I discussed with you. Uh, so I will touch a number of topics. And the first thing I really want to do is to mention at least some of the main co-workers uh, I have on, on, on this. And I will discuss approaches done in collaboration with Anna Bombo in Berlin at MDC, with whom we have a long-standing collaboration, but also Stefan, uh, the Max Planck, uh, Jim, Doug, Marieke in Oxford, Josie in McGill, Colin in Edinburgh, uh, David Holtz in Edinburgh, uh, Antonella in Naples, and uh, most importantly, I really want to stress the uh, the driving force behind most of what I'm going to discuss with you, which, which is the team working with me uh, in Naples and in part in Berlin. Okay, so uh, what's the data and uh, oh, what's the picture which is emerging from the analysis of the data? So I told you uh, already that uh, we know that chromosomes are not randomly folded in, in the nucleus of cells. You recognize the picture. This is the, the human cell nucleus. And those are the different chromosomes. And you see they form territories. So they, they form sort of geographical map. And, and they tend to, to, to have uh, statistically changing that, uh, but uh, say, uh, specific pattern. So, Say chromosome one and three tend to be close to each other, five a bit further apart, and, and so on. And as I told you, the limitation of microscopy uh, is a resolution limitation. So how can we really go to the scale of single uh, genes and single regulators to understand who's contacting who? And that has been done in a real uh, major step forward in the field uh, by Jobdecker. Uh, roughly 10 years ago, when, we envis when he envisaged the, the high C technology. Andrew told me he has already uh, given you uh, a glimpse of what's that about. So if I'm getting too boring, please stop me. Otherwise, I will uh, try to summarize that for you again. The idea behind high C uh, is also very, very nice and very, very simple. And it's roughly the following. We want to measure who's contacting whom, genome-wide. And uh, in the high C uh, matter, the idea is the following. Suppose you have two sites, the blue and the orange, which are in contact in some way. It's something which holds them together. Then the idea is, is simple. Uh, and it's the following. Suppose you can, by using some special enzyme, restriction enzymes, that's the name. You can cut your genome in, in pieces, in fragments. So you see, those enzymes cut at those specific position, genomite. And so after the action of those enzymes, the, the genome is, is, is cut in pieces. 
And if you think about it, you have two types of pieces. You have single fragments, those who are not interacting with anybody else. And instead, you have pairs, which are held together by the fact that they were in contact originally. And then, by some biochemical trick, you can ligate the extremities of those fragments, and you come up with a circle. And the circle includes a portion of DNA which originally was at a given position, and another portion, the orange one, which was at another position. And so you sequence those, and now it's just a matter of power of sequencing. It's just a matter of sequencing, uh, because uh, you sequence what you have, and when you sequence a fragment like those, the, you, you change them in something like that, I don't want to enter into many details. When you sequence one of those fragments, you sequence two portions which should be very far away, and so you can map where one piece of the fragment is from and where the other is from, and you just count how many times the two fragments have been sequenced together. And you come up with a map like this. This is called an IC, contact map. And the entries here tell you how many times those two fragments, the orange and the blue, have been sequenced together. And so that's a proxy of how frequently the two are together. And you can do that genome-wide. In, in this type of experiments, the resolution is only given by the sequencing depth, so how much you can sequence your the DNA you have. And in fact, there is another technical thing, which is the length. Not my micro. And the other technical thing is, is how big are the fragments? The, the average length of a fragment is given by the enzymes you use. And so that's the other limiting thing for the resolution. But at current developments, you can, you can go down to, say, uh, hundreds of, of bases. So very, very, very short uh, fragments. In fact, in this technology, there is an important bias, uh, which is... Uh, summarized here. And it's related to the ligation step. So the fact that you want to, for the technology to work, you have to, uh, to uh, bring together the two uh, dangling ends of the fragment you want to sequence. So this is the ligation step. And the ligation step has a problem, if you think about it. It is, it is introducing a strong bias. Because suppose, for instance, that you have three segments close one to the other. I told you that one gene on average has four regulators. But consider the simple case where you, have, you only have three things together. When you ligate, by definition, either you ligate one pair, or the other pair, or the other pair, and all the other quirky combinations you can think of. And so when you sequence one of the ligation products, by definition, you're sequencing only one of them. And so although you have three triplets, sorry, three doublets here, because it is one triplet, three pairs, you only sequence one. And so you have a bias of 66% uh, in, in the estimation of contacts. And that's one of the reasons why we developed the, the other technology I mentioned, GAM. But anyway, the high C was a real, a real major step ahead because it was the first time that we could access with very fine details in a quantitative way the frequencies of interactions of genome segments at genomic scales. And so it was the first time we could access at genomic scales who's interacting with whom uh, which genes and which regulators, and we could start delving into that. Uh, 
Absolutely. So uh, I, I don't know if you hear the question. The question is, is the pattern random or you see non-random patterns? And I think if you stare at it, you immediately see that there are non-random patterns, isn't it? So you see that there are blocks, blocks within blocks, uh, and there are portions which are more strongly interacting than others. Oh yeah, exactly. You're, this is precisely the type of questions that the community is working on at this moment. So, at those, no, uh, you're right. Let me let me go very slow on this. So, this is the contact map of an entire chromosome. This is in mouse. Uh, this is human. Uh, chromosome four. No, this is mouse. Chromosome fourteen. So this is almost the entire chromosome fourteen, which is hundred megabases roughly. And this is telling you. Uh, which portion of it are interacting with itself? And I think what you notice is that there are interactions at different landscapes. You have sort of, let me call them, more local interactions. Although, on that scale, these are distal interactions. Look at this block. Say, this is 10 mega, roughly. The fact that you have a block of interactions, this means that within 10 mega bases, things are are contacting each other in non-random fashion. But what I think you notice is that there are also interactions in bigger blocks. And if this is 10, this is 20, 30. So very distal interactions. <laughs> Maybe what you notice is that there are also interactions at much bigger scale, at the scale of the entire chromosomes. And this is the picture which I think is emerging from the data I'm going to discuss in a second. So far from random. Long ranged contacts. And this is exciting because you see, from, from a physicist's point of view, this is quantitative data. It's not just the picture. Okay, the two are contacting, but what, what can we do with that? Uh, we have frequencies of contact, or proxy for, with all the biases I mentioned. So the GAN technology uh, essentially uh, was an alternative to that, to, to high C. Uh, and uh, I told you the idea is to avoid the ligation problem. In fact, we started earlier <laughs> than high C. It took 10 years, though, to, to make all the steps I discussed before. And in a nutshell, I repeat the concept. To avoid the ligation step, you use the statistical idea. So you capsulize this to the nucleus. You see who is present in the nucleus by sequencing in the slice by sequencing. And by collecting statistics, you can come and decide, well, A and B are in contact or not. And the advantage here is that you can do that without the ligation, so with no biases with respect to high C. And you can do that for very few cells, because you see, you, we work at the single cell level. And uh, say, in standard approach, high C is not single cell. So you have, a, you have to squash a number of cells to have enough DNA to, to, to then reconstruct the content map. Uh, and you see the patterns as well. So the patterns are there, independently of the technology you use. It, it, and now this is what I, I, I want to, to discuss. So I'm following up on, 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 your, on your question. So the, this is, again, the map I showed you. Same chromosome, chromosome 14, uh, roughly 100 mega. And uh, I think by staring at it, by eye, you see the patterns as, as we already started discussing. But an important step ahead was made a few years later, the introduction of IC, uh, with slightly better data. Uh, what um, a group in, in California and in France uh, uh, discovered is that if you zoom along the diagonal, Notice, this is 2 mega. This is 100. So this is two orders of magnitude higher in resolution. You're looking within one of those blocks. Very, very high resolution with respect to the previous experiment. And what came out is that, you see, it is organized in sort of diagonal matrix, the content matrix. And I think you have understood what, what that means. 
there are blocks of interactions. There, the, the genome, a chromosome, is composed of a sequence of, uh, of regions where each region has strong interaction with itself and much weaker interactions with the rest of the chromosome. Because you see, if I move along with the chromosome, it is this block here which is strongly interacting with itself. And then there is another portion which is also strongly interacting with itself, but much weakly with the neighboring objects. And then another. And those blocks, you see, my eye was the scale. It's roughly one mega. In fact, it's half a mega, one mega. And they've been named, very quirky name for a physicist, topologically associated domains, TADs. But anyway, that's to mean that along a chromosome, you can see a chromosome as a sequence of regions with strong interactions with themselves and very weak interaction um, with the rest of the chromosome. And so the picture which emerged, the cartoon, of how chromosomes was fault, uh, was this in 2012. You have different regions which are strongly interacting with each other, with, with, with themselves, and, and, and very little with, with the others. However, I think by staring at the data, as, as you noted, you see that it's more complex than that. But first, let me give you, let me express my frustration in the way in which TATs are defined. And they are defined in a very heuristic way. So think of, I think, all the techniques you have studied in the previous lesson in this course, and your background as a physicist, is enough to go well beyond the state of the heart and the definition of TATs. They are defined this way. At least one of the definitions, now that is a little literature on the topic. But say the basic definition of TATs is roughly the following. Suppose you take a, a site on your chromosome. You literally count how many interactions it has on the left and on the right. And you make the difference of those two numbers and normalize in some way. If you look at that, this, this was named the directionality index, DI. If you plot DI along the sequence, you see that this is sort of a step function. It's very high, very positive in one portion, then it becomes negative, it remains negative, then it positive again, and, and you see. And by I, by I you see that more or less the blocks of consistent sign correspond to the blocks that you see in the matrix. But my frustration is that this is by eye, <laughs> in the sense that would you call this the passage to a new TAD or just a little fluctuations in the data? And so that's why there is a, a literature on the topic, how we define exactly that. And my impression is that this is going to depend on, on the depth of the data, so the quality of the data, the level of noise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But even today, uh, practically, this is the, say, heuristic definition of what a TAD is. And of course, what came out is that if you have better data, then you start discovering structures within the TAD. So a TAD is no longer one mega, but it's half a mega. And then it's no longer half a mega, it's 100K, because there are sub tads and, and so on. And in fact, what we showed is that you have to be careful in, in this, and you have to really take an account of confidence thresholds and, and so on. But the, here, the, what I would really like to convey to you is that any good idea in this field is good. You can improve on this without even me keeping lecturing. Or just a magnet, I guess. But anyway, as I told you, the impression is that staring at the data, that not only you have fundamental blocks of interactions and maybe blocks within blocks, but you have also bigger structures. I showed you the map of the entire chromosomes, and, and, and you immediately saw interactions at chromosomal scale. So all just a magnitude bigger than single tabs. And so we showed that, uh, in, again, in a very stupid and heuristic and a frustrating way, which I try to illustrate just to give you the sense of how 
uh, this type of the picture we have of our chromosome fold is, uh, has changed. So we, we run our own experiments. Uh, and uh, this is, again, high C data. And again, in, in mouse cells. And to be precise, what we did was an experiment in a modal system where you move from embryonic stem cells to uh, neural precursors and then neurons, post-mitotic neurons. Because we wanted to have two types of information. On one hand, how chromosomes fold. And on the other hand, how that changes during differentiation. Is the architecture of a neuron, the chromosomal architecture of a neuron, distinct, different from the architecture of a, as you asked at the beginning, uh, of an embryonic stem cell? And so we have a time course, three points. And uh, we have high C data, our own high C data. And we have transcription data, CAGE. CAGE data is technology to, to produce, uh, to have information of which gene is being transcribed. And I guess you have understood the reason we want to link architectural changes to transcriptional change. So uh, what you see here is a, an example of our data. This is a, by the way, this, this is a 2000. 15, the original thing. It's only three years ago, but it's already old in this field, the quality of the data. This is 5 mega, and I've changed the color scheme. Rather than using the one I showed you before, used by, by Job and the, and the school workers, so just red and white, we added shades, being the data slightly better. We added shades to give a sense of the scales of interactions. And I think here, you immediately perceive what, what you could already see in the original data. That is to say that there are, yes, blocks of interactions along the diagonal. If you want to call them blocks, this would be the tads, the black numbers, the squares with the black numbers. But you clearly see that tads do interact one with the other. Look at one and two. You clearly see that they form a higher order structure. So you see what I, what I have in mind. You know what is the higher order structure proteins. This means that you have a local folding and then folding at bigger scale, whereby distal portions come together. Here is the same. You see, half a mega blocks come together in a one mega block, and they come together in a two mega, and so on. You have a question. I Happy to know. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you better. You're right. I've not still described that. That's why you are confused. Let, let me go to that. So what I, I was trying to first introduce the, the, the concept and then, and then delve into some more. So uh, by staring at the data, if you define TADs the way I showed you before, so very heuristically, the TADs are those blocks. But you see by eye that they are interacting. This is the point I'm trying to, to make. You see that 1 and 2 are forming a bigger block, and uh, 4, 5, and 6 are also forming another block, and this block is distinct from that, and so on. And so in heuristic approach to try to see, uh, to identify higher order structure, as, as he asked, is uh, the one that we followed. This is a very naive, very stupid one, and it's the following. Suppose you want to find the most likely candidates forming a higher order structure. Well, you have to look at the pair of TADs which share the most interactions. And so we start from the list of TADs in this cartoon, the list of TADs. And we bring together, and we call a higher order domain, the pair which is the most strongly interacting pair. By definition, this is the most likely candidate to be forming a higher order structure. And we add that higher order domain, we call it a metatad, back to the list of the remaining domains and iterate. So this is stupid hierarchical clustering. Really stupid, really naive, maybe totally wrong. 
But nevertheless, the idea is that at each iteration, starting from the TADs, identified as I mentioned before, and I don't like how they are identified, but whatever TADs are, we start from them, and at each iteration, we are selecting, we are bringing together, clustering together, uh, the most interacting pair of objects. And so by definition, that's the most likely candidate. And you come up with a sort of a tree, as you expect by hierarchical clustering, and the tree tells you at each level uh, what's the organization at that scale. Now, this is really naive. And the first thing we had to do, of course, was to check whether the objects defined in this way are really bringing some statistical information. So you bring together the most interacting pair, but is that interacting above noise or not? So of course, uh, you can apply that to whatever you want, but maybe the objects you are defining, the higher order structures are meaningless from a statistical point of view. Their interactions are comparable to background. And so we, of course, made a number of tests, including uh, experiments to show the that metatats do exist. And I want to mention only one for the sake of brevity, please. Absolutely, exactly. I like this. This is the first question that comes to the mind of any statistical physicist. So is there scaling variant? If you apply Kadanov uh, transformations to those matters, how they look, I will get to that. And it's not that trivial as you can think. It's not just a power law. Let me put it this way. It's more complex. That's my thing. But anyway, uh, let, me, let me go exactly in that direction step by step. At some point, we have to stop. It's already 11. Um, very quickly, uh, the, one of the tests we, we, we made to, uh, to show that those objects, high order structures, are, are real, at least from an architectural point of view, as shown here. And I try to guide you through this, and then we um, meet again tomorrow. So the idea is the following. Suppose you have two domains, that one and that one, whichever they are. Fundamental tides were high order meta tides. We define their interaction, I, as literally the number of contacts they share in the high C or GAM matrix. So you count how many interactions they have overall. I, of course, is interesting. It's giving you a measure of how strongly they are interacting. But you want to compare that with this sort of, say, a Hill hypothesis, a background. And then we produce a random control model. Uh, which I want to briefly mention because uh, this is important. And the random model is the following. You take the high C data and you randomize the matrix. But you not fully randomize, randomly randomize. But you randomize subdiagonal by subdiagonal because you see immediately by eye that there is a genomic distance effect. And so you, want, you don't want to mix up the trivial genomic distance effects with which you must keep, and that you would have also in a background system, in a random system, with real interaction. And so if you think about, a subdiagonal is the locus of pairs which have the same genomic distance. And so we are randomizing only the contacts for all the pairs at that given genomic distance. And that's why the randomization bootstrap is, doing, is done subdiagonal by subdiagonal. In this way, in the random model, we hold the trivial effects just linked to genomic distance. You expect that interactions at large genomic distance are weaker than interactions closer to the diagonal. You want to keep that. This is trivial. But then, all the other patterns are washed away. So that's the control system we have. And so I come to you in a second. And so uh, what we measure then is 
the real interaction I and what we call the control or background interaction. That is to say, what would be I in the control system I just set? And now I'm going to discuss, after answering that question, what we found. Go ahead. This is a bootstrap. So you resample from the same distribution. And so you can produce how many samples you want. So it had very good quality for random work. So what we find is, uh, to cut short a longer story, is shown uh, here in this plot. You see here the ratio of what is the real interaction divided by the control interaction. So how, uh, as a function of the sides of the mated heads uh, considered. And the size of the mated heads is counted as the number of fundamental tads included in that mated head. And in green, you have roughly the expected random background. And in blue, instead, it's the real signal. And the expectation we had was, well, if there are only tads in the system, there are no higher order structures, there's no scale, uh, scaling whatsoever, the expectation would be, well, if tads do not interact with each other, or their interaction is comparable to what you expect in a background system, the blue signal should rapidly collapse to the green. And instead, you see that the blue remains statistically above the green, up to huge scales, comprising hundreds of tads. So I told you that a tad is roughly half omega. So 200 tads is an entire chromosome. This is showing you that what you noticed by I, the very same instant I showed the data, that there are significant interactions at chromosomal scales. And what we found is that this is not only in our mouse model, not only in mouse embryonic stem cells, not only in mouse precursors, neural precursors, not only in mouse neurons, it is in human cells. All the higher mammals where high C data are available show that hierarchical organization of chromosomes. And that's tested and confirmed by fish experiments. So we run experiments by fish, microscopy, so a different technology to show that indeed bigger portion of chromosomes come together at very big distances, genomic distances. And so this has changed the picture we have of chromosomes, which at least the way we think of it is that we have no longer single independent tads. But whatever those tads are, and I'm, I don't like the definition of tads as you understand, they tend to coalesce and form higher order structures, exactly as in proteins. And, this is, and there is a hierarchical organization of domains within domains across scales, from very tiny scales to very big scales, order of magnitude bigger, uh, comprising entire chromosomes. Well, I really would stop here. So see you tomorrow, unless you have questions. <laughs>